Hi folks, this is something I don't think we've ever done before or programming by stealth. I am interviewing someone who has written parts of the tool that we have just talked about in the series. So I am joined by one of the brains behind JQ called Matthias Wadman. So welcome and thank you. Oh, hey. <laughs> Hello, yes, I'm Matthias. Uh, I'm one of the maintainers of uh, JQ. Uh, I didn't really, I didn't start the project. It was started, I don't know, 10 years ago by that Stefan. Sounds Dopo. about right. Yeah, that sounds uh, about right. Uh, I'm, I'm only been a maintainer for like, I don't know, three years. So I'm, I hopped, hopped on late, late on. <laughs> so how many of you are there making JQ go? How many maintainers there are? Yeah. I think there are like eight people who are administrators or can do like things in the project, but maybe I would say it's only like five or something that is like active that do things. Or maybe three people are like very active. It's like me and uh, Nico and uh, Emmanuel and uh, Ichni, I think is the, we are the most active ones. But people, people come and go, I would say. <laughs> So, so as people discover JQ, they find a pain point. They say, oh, I wish it did blah, blah, blah. And if they have the skill set, I guess they contribute for a while. They add the feature. I would say there are like maybe four of, maybe five now that are stay around for a longer while. And then some people come and just do some small change and then they disappear. Yeah. But maybe you're like, I would say if we would do a new release, it would be like five people that are involved in the fixing things and writing change logs and helping out with things. And how, how does, how do you guys as a project decide, like what go, you know, how do you decide what's on the roadmap or is it very much led by the community or? I, I have to, there is no, I don't think there is any official, uh, like, like uh, policy on how five things work. So it's going to be what I, my interpretation of how we work. <laughs> I think it's usually that we are, what I've seen is that we, you, if we are like three maintainers who agree on something, we usually merge it. Uh, and, then, and then sometimes if it's a, like a bigger, more complicated change, I would say it's like bug fixes and like a kind of obvious behavior, uh, weird behaviors, I would say. Maybe we are three people who fix or approve them, we merge it. But if it's more... Uh, complicated things i think we, we usually wait for uh, nico or someone to who is like more or repeating some old maintainer all all the old active or old jq maintainer about the problem see if they if they what they think about it so we are we are, fa we are fairly like conservative when it change when it comes to changing the language itself like to add new built-ins or changing the syntax it's like it's nearly it never happens anymore, I would say. So it's like the most yeah. changes are crashes and uh, yeah, like things that are obviously wrong. I guess there's a huge difference between taking a built-in that already exists and making it do something a little bit different. That's already quite scary. Uh, but yeah, that that seems uh, that's probably the most scary. Actually, would be to, to take something that's in the language and make it different. But I guess the least scary is a bug fix, and then somewhere in between would be something again new built in or something. Would, would... Mm. Yeah, I, I mean the least scary is of course it's crashes, like something that should it shouldn't crash. That's not how it should behave. <laughs> that is like uh, that is, and those we we fix quite quite fast. I would say if it's more, uh, but it, it's tricky because it's like small. Small fixes is like usually that's why it's good to have many maintainers because usually someone comes up with the, figures out that oh this will break some existing JQ scripts. So there are there are behavior changes that we probably would have liked to have done, but we but we won't do them because if they would they would they will they will change things. And we have a couple of changes now that probably will change things in existing scripts, but it's like syntax like a like priorities between some uh, operators that are like very confusing. Like they probably the, the existing scripts that that will change how they behave now. They were probably written. Someone it's most likely the person didn't didn't mean it to behave the way it works right now. <laughs> I would say so. 
Yeah, so it, it will probably fix more scripts than it will break. <laughs> yeah, but nonetheless, if, yeah, if someone's written it intending the side effect, and then you change the side effect, it's, like, mm. it's the, the the S operator when you bind the new. Uh, well, that that one has some weird precedence, like how it binds the next, the rest of the query. That is like very confusing when you look at. Uh, <laughs> yeah. The source. So that sort of brings me to another interesting question. So JQ is a language, and it is mm -hmm. a command line tool. So it, how much of JQ is written in JQ? Because I, I have this feeling from the documentation that some of the built-ins are actually the reduce built-in wrapped in a function. Yeah. How much of JQ is JQ, and how much of JQ is something else? <laughs> I would say there is even, uh, if, if people are interested, there is this built-in.jq in the JQ repository. That is all the, like the ones that are written in JQ itself. And it's, it is quite a lot of the built-ins are written in JQ. But then there are, there are a few ones that are like, uh, they are either because they can't really be, or, or it's more like we don't want to write a, like a regex engine in JQ. So that's therefore it's like a, there is a built-in that binds to this uh, regex library that we use, or there are some like performance reason for doing it. Like it would be too slow to do it in JQ. Yeah. And, and so the reduce, some... the reduce yeah. is one that is used as the back end of many things. So obviously reduce couldn't be written in JQ. It must be written in a more fundamental language. Yeah. I mean, ah, yeah. The reduce that's, that even has like its own syntax. It, I don't think it can be a built-in even. Because it has this, like, uh, you do uh, reduce, I don't know, I don't even remember the syntax, reduce and the generate. Oh, yeah, the, the syntax is quite, yeah, the syntax is quite different, yeah. Like, uh, what are they called? Special forms, I think they're called in, 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 in like, they are, they are like functions, but they, are, they have their own syntax. But so, some of them, I think, are, uh, they are kind of like how, how the compiler works, is that they, they just get translated into a built-in some built-in function, but the syntax, how the user writes it looks special, but it just gets translated. Like an assignment, for example, in JQ, or update, when you do like equals or pipe equals, that actually gets like kind of translated into a set path, kind of, or an update, which is itself is a set path. That, that you can see in the built-ins.jq file, is uh, there is a quite big implementation of the thing that takes like the left hand side and the, the right hand side and then figures out the paths and <laughs> runs the generators on the on the right side and signs into the left side. <laughs> yeah. So then cool. And then that code is kind of complicated. And it some of some of the built in uh, JQ functions, they they do they use some special things that you shouldn't use in normal JQ queries <laughs> because it's like kind of like special they have some special knowledge kind of how they Behave. They might know about the inner brains of JQ that isn't in the documentation. So they are kind of, some of them are, I guess it's more like, I don't know the history of some of them, but they are kind of hacks, I would say, just to fix some reference counting, to, to be able to release the reference on one of the sides and things. Yeah, so don't, don't, but you could probably implement most of them in one normal JQ code if you want. <laughs> but they would be, it would be slower or use more memory. If you do, if you if you didn't have these hacks, kind of, yeah. As long as you have them from people, I guess it's okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, yeah, and so th that brings the the nerd in me to the other obvious question. So, a whole bunch of JQ is written in JQ, which is cool bootstrapping, and I love that kind of thing. But obviously, yeah. there must be something lower down because it can't all be built in itself. So, what is the, the really native language? Is it C or what is it? Uh, it's written in C. Or actually, if you want some some t history trivia, it was, it was actually written in Haskell, the first version. Oh. Wow. <laughs> if, you, if you go to the, if you check the Git repository, the first uh, commit is like a whole, is a JQ written in Haskell. Like a, a proto-JQ is a very simple version of JQ. And then you can see that a couple of months later, the whole implementation got changed to C. <laughs> so someone had the idea. They were like, I wonder, could this work? And they implemented it in Haskell, which is obviously their language of choice. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I've <laughs> done a lot of first attempts at code in Perl, and I would never intend to keep it in Perl. 
but it's like just to prove to myself that this is actually a good idea. And and then obviously you, you move to another language. I guess yeah, my guess is that it was kind of a prototype just to see how how it would work. But yeah, but now nowadays it's it's, it's uh, C. All of it is C, uh, and it's and it's very similar to other languages like Python or anything. It's like it's a it's a it's like a parser that kind of compiles down to some kind of bytecode that then runs in a virtual machine kind of. So there is like a JQ, uh, very JQ specific virtual machine inside JQ. I'm thinking back to my compiler classes at university many years ago. That that makes sense. And so it, it's all written in C. So the command line interface and the core code are obviously very closely mm. related to each other then. Um, and now I'm, I'm a Mac person, so I just install uh, homebrew and i go brew install jq and all the magic happens and i on linux i go yum install jq and all the magic happens is there does the c code work on windows yeah it does it, <laughs> i think i think none of the maintainers currently is a windows user which is a kind <laughs> of a problem because uh, we we, uh, we still want to support windows or it has support Unix before i we have to support windows somehow but we do what we do is that we compile it with this uh, it's called min min gv which is like a pusix uh, like a unix ish environment for for windows so you can kind of take uh, win like unix programs and and then uh, min gv is the one that uh, kind of emulates to make it work like a unix environment and so that's what we do for windows so the windows people would have the same uh, so they would have jq.exe or whatever, and then it would have the yeah. same command line flags, but would they yeah. be backslashes instead of minus minuses, or is it even I, still minus minuses? It's uh, minus minus. <laughs> good, good. Teach, teach them proper. Teach them proper. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, maybe we can talk later about, it. about writing jq, how much jq is jq, is that uh, if we talk about later, we're going to talk, maybe talk about fq, and fq goes a bit further than jq. Well, that's a good opportunity. So we talked a lot about JQ. Uh, I don't think on the show we talked about FQ. So let's assume we don't know what FQ is. Can you explain what it is and how it fits into this universe? Uh, so FQ is, a, it, it tries to be behave like a CLI wise. It behaves, tries to be exactly like JQ more or less. Like how okay. it behaves with input files and output. It's just that instead of uh, giving it JSON files, you can give it uh, various binary formats as input, like an MP4 file or a JPEG or a PNG or. And then FQ has uh, decoders that kind of takes the binary file and then uh, massages them into like a JSON-ish uh, data structure. So you'd be representing like image bit information in a yeah. JSON-like structure. Yeah. So it, it kind of so it is the structure is like the, the same J, JSON-ish types like objects, arrays, and number strings. But what it does is that it uh, uh, when you run the like FQ has like a it's like a bit stream decoder. It's like a bit reader. It reads uh, bits from binary files, and then it has a decoder, like a decoder DSL, that can kind of uh, keep track of where things are in the file. So you get like a JSON structure where all the fields, like an object or a number, also knows from which, what bit range from the original file it, like corresponds to this thing in the structure. Oh. So you can kind of like, uh, so you can get like a hex dump and next to it, you see a tree, like a JSON structure over. But it's not really JSON. It, it behaves like JSON, but you can, sure. you can, so you can kind of decode things into. Uh, so then you can use uh, JQ queries on that data structure to find things or uh, whatever you want to do. And change it, obviously, then. You can't really just assign things into it. It's kind of like a read-only data structure you get. Uh, if we want to go into details of FQ works, it's, it's, uh, FQ is also very, uh, it's very decoder centric. It's it's about presenting uh, a file, kind of like how how something uh, uh, 
uh, if you give it like an MP4 file, it, it will show you all the boxes in an MP4 file, if you know how an MP4 file works. And it will show you the tracks and all the samples. And then it will also kind of like a map, uh, well, like number values into st string representations of the numbers and things. So it, it will kind of decorate the data for you. So you don't have to keep track of all the mappings of uh, numbers. And maybe it even, maybe it even, even like calculates things into, uh, maybe it like derives things also while it's decoding. So it's it's a it's a it's like a pretty printer for for binary files, you can say. Yeah. So I guess just for the listeners, so one of the things you may not realize is that a, a movie is actually in an MPEG format is kind of, you start off with a keyframe and then you tell it how to change the pixels until yeah. the next keyframe when it's a fresh start, and then you tell it how to change the pixels and then you tell it how to change the pixels. So those are data structures, you know, yeah. I want to move this to here. And so that's then represented in a JQ like, or a JSON like format of lists, uh, exactly. lists, dictionaries, etc. Yeah. Oh, wow. This kind of this is just, it's kind of like my my idea, how I got the idea was that when I played around a lot with JQ is that I realized that uh, like JQ, the language, doesn't really care that it is JSON, that it's inputs and outputs. It just needs to be something that can be number strings or booleans or uh, arrays or objects. It doesn't really care that it is JSON, like the format, it's JSON from it itself is not so important. It just happens right. so if you I mean, if you if you want to play play with the it's like it's like of course it it was mapped from JSON, but uh, yeah when you can it does the JQ interpreter or the language doesn't need it as long as you can yeah as long as you like the the data structure behaves as JSON kind of then you can do whatever you want kind of. Well, what I I mean I think the reason JSON is so popular is because actually, if you have as your three primitives a single piece of data, a list of pieces of data, and a name-value pair of data, you can yeah. represent almost anything with those three primitives. Yeah, exactly. it, is, it is very, very powerful. And I've noticed that when I, when I have written a lot of binary decoders for FQ, is like that you can usually come up with a very good like, modeling of... Uh, of course, there are formats that are very that has like a references and things, but then you can maybe you can usually you can represent it as a, like an array of uh, objects and then another array that has just has like IDs into that. So you can represent graphs or whatever you want to. If your value can be a path in another array, then you can probably represent yeah. almost anything. Mm -hmm. And uh, the obvious thing that as a photographer, what obviously leaps to my mind is a lot of our mm -hmm. binary files have like ye olde data in them. So exif and ID3, so that seems like a really good match for something like JQ. Yeah, exactly. It works. Yeah, it works very well. <laughs> and it's also it's also the what FQ do like a lot of these binary formats, like for MP4 or JPEGs or PNGs, is that they these binary files they usually have a common formats inside of them. Like uh, if you have TIFF or uh, EXIF, for example. Like uh, nearly all uh, all image containers can contain EXIF, right? Which is the idea, yeah. So there is an EXIF decoder in FQ, and then the the other PNG and JPEG decoders they they use that EXIF decoder. So you kind of get like a tree, and then it gets like a, the, the the tree from the EXIF decoder gets like appended into that tree. So you can get like nested nested decoding with the FQ. Which is also very very nice. <laughs> and then my, my brain has jumped straight away to, and then you have another decoder for zip and rar files, and then you can yeah. nest all of those, and then you really can go to absolutely uh, go to town. I, I, of course, it's uh, if you work with I. I mean, I work as a. I'm I'm a back end engineer, but I work as a like a media engineer, you could say. So I work with streaming media and transcoding. Right. So then. So then you have all the like MP4 is the most common format, but there are others, and then and all the like codecs, they also have their own like bitstream formats. So then you can just write one like a sem like in the H264 uh, decoder, not not the full decoder because that's like a huge uh, huge. <laughs> okay, <laughs> the yeah. specification is like a thousand pages, but you can you can like decode with FQ, you can kind of decode the, the uh, 
uh, like the overall, like the biggest parts of it. And then you can skip kind of like the actual pixel or uh, macro blocks or whatever. But you can get like a very good overview mm -hmm. uh, for the for the sample format. And then you can use that sample, like an H264 sample decoder, together with different container decoders. So you can just like uh, you can just just reuse it more or less. Cool. So you don't have to write many good decoders. <laughs> Right, because so many things are common, yeah. So what sort of file formats do you currently support in FQ? Uh, I, I would say most uh, media containers, it's the watch, like the most commonly used, MP4, Matroska, and uh, like all the PNG, JPEG. Uh, what about PDF? Is... Exif, it has, and TIFF. Uh, and then it has some support for like uh, network capture file, like PCAP. Ooh. Oh, that's sorry. With my cybersecurity hat on, you've just pinged me here. That that's very interesting. Uh, and it and it, it uses something called uh, Go Packet, which is a uh, Go. It is uh, FQ is written in Go, so it's so I can use some. So it actually uses some already existing libraries. So it it can also do uh, TCP reassembly. So you can kind of take a PCAP and then continue decoding the TCP stream. Ooh. Like uh, currently there is no HTTP decoder, but I actually work, I have been working on it. But then, but then you can kind of uh, decode like uh, it has uh, like TLS for example support, but not wow. uh, the modern TLS. It has support for TLS 1.2 and 1.1. So then you can decode that further down. So it's like that's the like the, that's the whole point of FQ is that to Decode as much as possible kind of, <laughs> to make it yeah. very so. So you as a, someone who's debugging some problem with a file or something weird is happening, you you should be able to just run FQ, query it, and then see all the and as, and that kind of the data should be as decorated as possible with explaining everything what everything is and if there is like a timestamp somewhere in FQ you will see like the sec like the number in seconds but then there will be a like a description afterwards saying this is the the date in a, like Unix time this means 19 blah 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 so it, it tries to kind of say what things are so, you, so it's it's kind of it's a, the whole point of it is to for me when I'm using is to kind of make it to lessen the cognitive burden when you are debugging something to like to give you as much, show you as much as possible, translate as many things as possible for you so you can just, yeah. I, I've noticed it It helps a lot when you're debugging things that you can just see that. Uh, right. Um, yeah, oh, this, the, 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 the color space on this uh, thing is, uh, is actually wrong compared to this color space down here. So then you can just see, ah, oh, they, they map to the, like the wrong, app, or whatever it is you're doing. Right, right. <laughs> Usually when you're debugging, the thing you're desperate for is information, right? Give me the facts. What, what's actually gone wrong? What's this? <laughs> yeah. And then you go back to your code and you find the logic and you go, oh, silly me. You know, I, I did blah, blah, blah. So <laughs> with my cybersecurity hat on my head, the thoughts of being able to take a giant big PCAP file, because of course the problem with trying to find problems on a network is networks are very noisy places, especially in the real world. <laughs> it's one thing to be you know, in a lab environment with one PC, but in the real world, it's just all noise. And the thoughts of being able to use all of the functionality of JQ to filter down packets in a That's, syntax uh, I'm really comfortable with, instead of trying to write Unix um, net, uh, TCP dump filters, which are horrible, um, the thoughts of being able to do that in JQ syntax does sound a lot nicer. Yeah, it, it's. Uh, I would say it, the only problem is that it, it it might be that if you have huge files, FQ is not very good because it's it's built in a way uh, because of technical limitations or, or things I would like that I wanted that kind of uh, is in the way of making it fast for big files. I wanted to, there are some features that, that uh, requires to kind of have the whole file in memory at the same time. So then you Ooh. can't really, <laughs> but there are some, to, to some extent, you have to decode the whole thing to do the queries kind of. But I'm just sort of thinking again, it could be a first pass where you end up with some JSON data 
that you could then output from FQ, I presume. So you could start off with a big PCAP that has life, the universe, and everything that you don't want. And you use JQ to only filter it to a big JSON file of the stuff you care about. And then you save that big JSON file. And from that point on, you now work in plain old JQ and you process that JSON file, which JQ is fantastic at. Yes, that's how I've done several times to kind of minimize down the thing you're actually looking for. And then <laughs> and yeah. On a related note, so JQ comes about because we want to process JSON, and it turns out that JSON represents something really generic. Therefore, with uh, FQ, you have found another use for that same language. And something we discovered, uh, or I discovered uh, on a cybersecurity blog recently, is XQ which is a project that tries to, they haven't quite got feature parity yet with the JQ language, but their aim is to support every built-in in JQ. And they have input filters and output filters. So you basically say, I want to take this TOML file, I want to query using all of the JQ language primitives, and I want to output, say, a YAML file, or yeah. a JSON file, or even CSV, although for CSV, they then say, well, now, if you want to write CSV, I'm afraid to say you cannot have any dictionaries at the last part. You need to be down to just arrays, whatever. Mm. But it's actually the fact that that language can be, mani- yeah. can be reused is kind of fascinating to me. And uh, yeah. So I presume you guys aren't upset to hear that people are taking your language and using it for other projects. <laughs> no, I think it's. Uh, I, I'm doing everything to uh, to make JQ more like the language more used or more known, because I th- I think it's. Uh, and I don't really I don't really care if the people are use as long as they write JQ. I don't really care if they use FQ or whatever they use whatever you need. <laughs> well, okay, I'm really happy to hear you say that because. So that's what I'm trying to help people understand, like to. To uh, ev- evangelize the, what, what it actually is. I feel like a lot of times people, and even myself, I remember like uh, maybe five, six years ago, I didn't know much about JQ at all. I thought it was uh, like a JSON indenter, more or less. <laughs> a pretty printer. A pretty printer for JSON. And I, well, I don't know, I remember one day I was doing something and I, I knew that you could write filters like in this weird, with this weird syntax that I didn't understand. And I was reading the, I, did, I guess I did more on man JQ and then like, like what the hell is this? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think that's how a lot of people find it, right? Because you go to Stack Overflow and they give you one little piece of JQ that probably has one map, one map function maybe or whatever, or map values or something. And it outputs something useful. And then you go, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. And then you start to dig a little deeper and go, what if I could multiply it together while I was doing that? Oh, I can do that too. And Oh, I can do that. And then before you know it, you have this giant big thing. And then for me, the light bulb moment was the minus F flag, where mm-hmm. instead of me thinking I have to fit all of my logic onto one line that goes on the command line, I suddenly end mm-hmm. up with an indented file that is nicely structured where I can have comments and I can even define my own functions at the top. And once I realized yeah. I could put my JQ into a file, that that was game changing. That that utterly changed things because I I now have JQ files for problem domains. Like for example, the Have I Been Pwned database is a giant big like when you query its API, you get back giant big JSON, and mm. you kind of end up needing to merge pieces together. So the minus minus slurp file flag is fantastic for that. Um, so you basically you download the data dump once, and it tells you these are all the breaches that have ever happened that we know about. And then you use the API to say, and now tell me where my users are. And then you need Mm -hmm. to marry those two data files together, right? So that you actually get enriched information. And I just have one big JQ file that has all of the functions I need to marry it out. And instead of getting back a whole bunch of garbage, I just run one terminal command and it tells me these five users, those people need to be told to change their passwords yesterday. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's that's kind of how how FQ started was that I I was using like the JQ the normal JQ for um, because there there are a lot of tools like tools for working with media files to like dump yes. them into different various XML and uh, custom their own weird custom formats so you can run like on an MP MP3 file or a FLAC file and, and you get some very detailed information about it but they are they are all different formats. So what I did was to always like massage this into JSON, 
and then kind of get it into JQ so I can do queries on it. Then I got t- tired of that after a while. Like, can't I? Is there, okay, yeah, yeah, can the, I go straight to it? Yeah. And you also, I also wanted to have kind of like because when you do that, you kind of do you lose the you lose the information from where from where this MP like the the thousand MP3 frame like where is that in the file? When you use these other tools and turn into JSON, you will lose that information unless you, of course, encode, it. encode the stop byte or stuff. But but the default in those tools you usually didn't. So then you. But that's also why I why I didn't end up writing JQ or FQ. No, no, that makes a lot of that, that makes so much sense to me. I, I can see exactly how the problem to be solved leads you straight to that solution. Uh, the other thing is, I am forever looking for a minus minus JSON flag. Like, if you tell me about something in the terminal, I am just looking for something that goes minus minus JSON as an option because then I can pipe it to JQ and then you know rearrange the key so they all make sense. And what the listeners have heard as the episode before this one is a case study where another one of our listener contributors, um, the helmet is someone who contributes a lot to the programming by self, but not usually on air. Um, but herself and Alison did an episode together. Um, and the problem to be solved was she was getting a new Mac and she wanted to know what apps have I got, which apps are already um, M series apps and which apps are universal and which apps are x86. And she discovered that the terminal command to tell you what's installed has a minus minus JSON flag, which was then mm-hmm. the start of a rabbit hole that ended up with this <laughs> .jq yeah. file that did all of the transformations and then renaming all the weird things Apple does, like calling it, you know, if it came from the Mac App Store, but you've got it on, uh, sorry, if it came from the iOS App Store, but you got it on a Mac, it calls it an iPad app and just translate all of that weirdness and give you back with the app CSV uh, output format give you back a perfect CSV of exactly the information that you wanted. Mm. You know, and, and that just sounds like the kind of thing a lot of people would end up doing with JQ. It's like, oh, this command gives minus minus JSON, and we're off. <laughs> I would say it's one, one thing I've thought, now, now when I'm, uh, now I'm such a big JQ user, so I use it for more or less everything instead of awk and things and everything. <laughs> so you know, I, I'm so used to it now, so I use it for everything. But uh, but like, well, one thing I've noticed is that at JQ is very good at uh, uh, taking like uh, text formats, like CMA structure, non, non-JSON as input. And then you use this like uh, dash R, you know, the big R. So you get like so it takes like all the lines or even even the whole file as one big text. So you get like yeah. one. You either get like a or you can slurp raw slurp things into. Then yeah. you get like a big, one big string, string. Yeah. or text. And then you like the JQ language itself is very good for like splitting and using the regex things to kind of like write their own like ad hoc parsers kind of. Good point. Yeah, that's very like the, this. Uh, what's it called? This uh, capture, I think it's called the built-in. Yes, that is very, very, very powerful. Where you can kind of like even give names to the groups, and it even it spits out like oh. objects for you. Like it's super. Yeah, super I, I do that quite a lot because yeah. I, I I love regular expressions. I I'm a big fan of regular expressions. They don't scare me. But when I've done a regular <laughs> expression, I want the output to have sensible names for each of the capture groups. And that's where a built-in like capture is great because once you've captured them to named fields, well, from then on, you can use the normal JQ syntax in a very sane way. So all of your insanity is captured in one line yeah. and then sanity for the rest of your file. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So you use the JQ to make sense of things. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I am really happy to hear you say that you see the language as being a much bigger thing than the command line tool because I spent yeah. a lot of time in the series, always differentiating between the language and the command. So I would say in the JQ language, and I would not use a uh, code style fixed with formatting. Mm-hmm. And then whenever I talked about, you know, the minus F flag, I would write JQ mm-hmm. with the code style fixed with formatting to basically differentiate. I am talking about a command line tool versus mm-hmm. I am talking about a generic language. And for a long time, my co-host Allison would, would be quite confused by the difference until we encountered XQ. Where it's like, yeah. all of the bits where I wasn't saying the command, all of those bits yeah. you can bring with you to this other tool. And the only thing that is different is the 
you know, the command line tool, the minus F or whatever. And so yeah. again, FQ then is exactly the same concept. The FQ will have yeah. different flags to JQ, but the language and the filters is exactly. your friend. Yeah. Your friend and the FQ, FQ even tries to copy how the CLI tool works. Because I think well, that's even more at home. Yeah. Also, to FQ, make it the... XQ has intentionally not copied it, which is probably better on the whole because it does such different things. And so it's not confusing enough to trick you. So it will be like minus minus Jason and you know minus minus Tom and stuff. So it's kind of intentionally different. Yeah. But the fact that once I open that single quote and I start to write the filter, the filter is my good familiar Jason or sorry, JQ <laughs> language. And there can be no JSON involved. There could be Tomal going to YAML and I'm filtering it away with the JQ language. And at no point was there any JSON created or harmed, you know, yes. in the process. Exactly. Just data. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say, well, I think we got into FQ because I was going to say that uh, FQ itself is, uh, it's not written totally in JQ. Of course, it's a lot of Go code too. But uh, this, like this, you can say that uh, the CLI part of FQ, like the CLI interface is actually written in JQ in FQ. So it is oh. the, the, you can say that the, the main function kind of is written in JQ in FQ. So the CLI, oh, like all nice. the all the command line that are parsing and uh, everything that is kind of, you can say that they, like JQ is in uh, is the one that is the controlling language and then just calls out to different uh, Go functions that are built-ins that are so, so, so FQ has a has some special built-ins that is not part of the normal JQ standard library. So it has like a there is like a, a read line built in for example to to implement uh, like an interactive shell. Yes. And it has like a, it has some function for opening a file for example that JQ doesn't have. So it's like it has like a, it has one function to like open a file. And then you get like a special, uh, like a binary file. It, it behaves like a string, but uh, uh, internally in JQ, it, it, uh, in FQ, it, it keeps track of that, that this is actually not a string. This is like a, a reference to uh, an open file. So then you can kind of pipe it into a decode function. So then the decode function can kind of, uh, in how it works is that it. Uh, I, I don't want to change. The, I don't want to add the new type into JQ or into JSON because or it's. Right. I, I've tried in the beginning. It did not work well. You don't want to have a new like a binary type in in JQ. It like all the built-ins with break and all the like. So, so you have to. So there is a. So some of the special uh, FQ functions they they can take like the value input, and it can it has like special things that so can kind of like in like uh, interrogate the value and ask this uh, this thing is it actually binary in the <laughs> so then it can kind of okay okay it is binary so it can kind of say like uh, and if it was a string it would actually turn it into a, a binary like a utf8 uh, bytecodes kind of. yeah, or, or with code points uh, and that's so another that's thing i love is that it's utf8 all the way down in jq you don't have to yeah. think about it that, that, I yeah, like that. and that's the there's also one of the problems with JQ is that it has UTF-8 as input and output because that's not, uh, uh, you can't have raw output because there are some things you can't. There are some mm -hmm. uh, byte values that are not valid UTF-8, so then it breaks down. <laughs> oh, it's funny, <laughs> some, in my yes, universe, the biggest problem is UTF-8 not being supported because I'm thinking in terms of strings and characters and stuff. And so for me, the fact that JQ is UTF-8 all the way down is this amazing yeah. luxury. Um, <laughs> exactly. But of course, it's good. In the, yeah, in the binary yeah. world, yeah, okay, you need every possible byte combination. Yeah, uh, for example, like for example, in, in with the FQ, you maybe you want to open some binary file, and then you want to output uh, some frames, or maybe part of a pcap file, and you want to select part of it, and then output that into a new binary file. And if it was UTF-8 out, it would uh, it wouldn't work. It would it would encode stuff like uh, it would it would end up encoding this as replacement characters or something. So FQ has support for knowing that uh, okay the the thing that I'm outputting now is actually uh, binary, but then I'm okay with just I will just output it as it is. 
Gotcha. Kind of. That's probably. Yeah. So you. So, uh, so I meant what I meant with the with the how that FQ is written in JQ is that. Uh, uh, the code is quite complicated nowadays, but in the in the beginning, it was kind of a, like the main function in FQ was more or less like a read pipe, like, like open pipe, decode pipe, dump. That was <laughs> that was kind of a, the 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 main main dot c dot jq. Cool. Is, I so do like this now, bootstrapping yeah. thing because I think a lot of people don't realize how much code under the hood is actually written in the language itself. Like a lot of JavaScript is JavaScript. A lot of PHP is PHP. A lot of yeah. JQ is JQ, which is something that unless you've written a compiler, you would never think. At least at least for JQ, in, in the beginning, it was actually written in Go. Most of the, uh, like the CLI was also written in Go. But the, the more features I, add, I added, the more I realized that this this gets more and more like complicated that the Go code has to call kind of JQ code and JQ code has to call Go code. So it was easier to just kind of let the JQ code be in control and then just call out to Go code. So the Go code never, uh, not, not really true. There are cases where the Go code actually calls JQ code, but that's like very internal things. But then mm -hmm. if you do it that way, is that everything, if everything is in JQ, uh, all these generators and things just works. Like it, it behaves as the CLI, like it, it just feels natural when you... Right. <laughs> like there was a lot of things that just solves itself automatically because now, now it just works the way if you want it to behave like that you want the cli tool to behave as the jq language and if you have if you have noticed that you can you can kind of say that uh, one of the things that took a while to when it's like aha moment was that i when you realized that, that the cli tool is kind of like a, that you have a input that uh, that that it outputs uh, J, like several JQ values. That's like the generator. So it's like the CLI tool itself is kind of like a JQ function also, kind of, if, if you don't give it a lot of weird uh, filter, like arguments. It's like yeah. typing two JQ command uh, processes together is kind of like nearly as, so it's kind of like it fits uh, very well <laughs> together everything. No, you you're right. Well. And before I discovered the joys of using, um, minus f and having my jq in a separate file i was often resorting to piping jq to jq to break my logic yeah. into pieces and i mean it, it works and it works it works really it well like a generator the whole cli tool works like a generator and it yeah because it's json it just you can just tape it to the next jq so, so it's a, and it yeah and that is and uh, and behavior implementing that behavior was very easy when itself is written in JQ. Cool. So one, one of the things I was slightly, I, I definitely want to touch on in this conversation with you. So you, you, you spend a lot of time in JQ. JQ is obviously very much something you understand. And you, you think of the universe in a JQ-like way now, now that you've you know, <laughs> discovered its power. Uh, but when I was writing the show notes, I was doing one of those really scary things is I was only about two or three lessons ahead of the virtual class. I was learning JQ a little bit ahead of what I was writing in the show notes, but not very far ahead. And then I was trying to write the show notes and I was trying to try. I don't like to use the wrong jargon when I'm teaching something because then people can't go to Google and they can't get useful help because I've used the wrong word. So I was always using the word filter and stuff like that. Yeah. But I did find it difficult to try to get my brain to think the way JQ sees the world because it's so different to other programming languages I've used because it's not a programming yeah. language, it's a data manipulation language. I am very curious how you found listening to us try to explain JQ. Did you, how, how do you think, how is that? I think you, I think, I think you understood it similar to how I do, but maybe you used, I think you just used different terminology for some things. I think the biggest thing you'll have noticed is that because of history on our series, we didn't refer to objects as objects because we started off in a JavaScript world where there was a difference between an object that had functions and an object mm -hmm. that only had data. And so we started to call the ones that were only data dictionaries because they mapped a name to a value. And when we moved into JQ, I, I argued with myself a lot. Do I call them objects, even though everyone listening to the show thinks an object can contain functions? 
Or do I mm. continue to use the programming by stealth word dictionary, which is not really, it's not, it's neither JavaScript jargon nor JQ jargon, right? It's programming by stealth jargon. And I argued with myself a lot, but I decided to bring the dictionary jargon with me into my description of JQ. So I imagine straight away when you heard me talking about sequences and dictionaries, you were like, oh, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> no, I'm, uh, no, I, I'm trying to remember what it was that uh, there was something. Um, I can't remember exactly what it was that was. There was some terminology that was. Uh, uh, yeah, but I think I, I think me. I mean, what I've noticed, what people uh, have the hardest time to understand, maybe in JQ, is the. I mean, it's the generators. I would say is the. Yeah. That every that everything is a generator. Yeah, sometimes it's a generator that makes one value, and sometimes it's a generator that makes more than one value. But yeah, I, that took me a long time to understand. Yeah. At, uh, that took a while in, in, in when it kind of when you get used to it that and you realize that everything is just generators even it's it helps to even think about uh, like uh, string literals or something as generators also that just outputs themselves kind of uh, yeah one string comes out yeah 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 and then it becomes very very consistent all the way down yeah and very logical and sometimes when JQ does things in a way that's unusual when you stop and think about it as a list of generators. It's like, oh, okay, well, of course it would be that way around. Um, and that's yeah. actually something I wanted to commend you guys on. Uh, the documentation, it, a lot of times it does a very good job of explaining the thinking. And it yeah. really struck me when you put the section on defining your own variables way, 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 way down the bottom. Like, it's nowhere near, yeah. like, I'm used to going to my first programming language, and the very first thing you learn is this is how you make a variable, this is an if statement, this is a for loop. And when you come to JQ, the first thing you're told is don't make variables, don't use conditionals, and definitely don't use loops, right? Because that's not how this language works. Uh, even I remember from, the, I, I, I haven't written that part of the manual, or I haven't written, uh, mo most, of the, most of the documentation hasn't changed much the recent years, well, so. It's in a section called advanced features. Right. Yeah, exactly. Defining a variable is advanced features. Yeah, maybe it should be. Uh, I guess most people maybe don't need uh, very uh, like these uh, bindings, but uh, uh, may, may, yeah, they should be. They should be. Uh, it, they should be described much better because it is very. They are very useful. I mean, it's it is this thing that uh, if you don't know about them, you. I think you can. There are some things you can't do anymore. Like you, you, yes. you will fail to do it. Like you. You will think, like, if you don't know that they exist, you will struggle. Yes, and I, I can give you an example. I can give you a fact. So I was, so the documentation says most of the time you don't need variables. For example, if you want to get the average, you just, uh, was it uh, add and length and add, you know, add divided by length and hey presto, you, you have your average. You don't need to actually make a variable and count it up and loop over it. You just do it in one step. And I was like, oh, wow, okay. And so I made a mental note don't teach variables in the series until you find a problem where there is no other answer. And the problem where there was no other answer was when you have a dictionary that is structured on, that is indexed on one key and you want to reorder it so that it's indexed on a different key. And there's no way to do that without keeping track of one of the keys as a variable. And at that point in the series, I introduced the as keyword, but until then I didn't. And I'm kind of glad I went that way around it because it means that me, as much me as anyone else, the question is always, do I really need a variable or am I doing this wrong? And a lot of time the answer is no, Bart, simplify. This is way easier than you think. You're overcomplicating this code and don't make it a variable. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you sh I mean it's the, 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 the JQ, if you can do it without a variable, you should probably not use a variable. But it depends a bit if you, of course, if you write like, I have had the situation where I have like, very complicated JQ code. And then like, I could write this, like nearly like code golf this into not <laughs> using variables, but it would be like, a, it's just like a mess of, uh, so maybe you want sometimes to, I, I, I even like write like very variables, variables JQ code to name things and uh, to 
to make it clear like what is yeah, it's a i guess it's a as all 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 programming you have to it depends what you what you want to well right what are you maximizing because maintainability yeah. is something i sometimes see developers yeah. forget about so they say yeah but by making this variable, we're wasting memory, and this isn't efficient. And I'm like, yes, but six months from now, when you're gone and I'm gone, someone else has to fix this code. Are they going to figure it out? Or if I name this variable and put a comment above it, is that going to make this code last longer? I'm like, oh, I suppose. Yeah. I would say in the in JQ, I, my 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 philosophy is usually is that if the if the JQ function, or if you write the some a function or a query or something, and if it's if it only is like three or four filters pipe together and you can do it without naming things i usually just let it be without naming but as but when it starts to become like some kind of nesting and then maybe i start to break out things into to uh, naming things somehow yeah which can you can do with the update operator and just start to basically say well i really don't like this key being named this silly thing because it came from a terminal command and i'll just rename them and sometimes that's mm-hmm. enough but then there are yeah. times when you just want to capture the variable and say five filters deep here in this nesting. I'm really going to want to have a quick and easy name for this thing I now know. And I'm yeah. just going to shove it into a variable, give it a nice human friendly name. And yeah. then <laughs> later in the file, I can call it by its nice human friendly name. Mm. Cool. Well, look, thank you. Firstly, I should say to the, to the listeners, a big thank you to you because you've actually reached out to us. So you saw that we were doing a series on JQ, and re- you reached out to us on, I think it was Mastodon. I think you're one of those modern Mastodon people, instead of that evil <laughs> Twitter thing. Um, and you basically offered to come and have a conversation with us, which no one has ever done before. No, no one has ever, mind you, the JavaScript developer is probably too busy to come talk to us. <laughs> but it was really nice of you to reach out. And so I'm really, I really, I just really want to thank you for we had arranged this interview and then I had a bit of a health crisis and then we had to rearrange everything again and you were really good about that. And so I just want to say a big thank you to being so forbearing and for giving up a not insubstantial chunk of your afternoon here. So thank you. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> now I've tried, I've tried to spread, spread the word of JQ. So I've been trying to like Eventually. write uh, JQ programs and JQ tools for making it easier to write JQ programs to just to show what you can use it for. Cool. Uh, mm. uh, the other obvious thing is, uh, would you like to tell the listeners where they can, is there anything you want to plug, basically? It's obviously FQ. I will put a link to FQ in the show notes. If, if they're working with, uh, you can actually work with uh, the text format also. It has support for XML and HTML and a lot of, and it actually has function to turn it back into some other format also. So if you do, you can use that. Well, that's given me a whole bunch of other ideas because well, I have some code at the moment that's using a really heavy JavaScript library that basically does an entire document object model. And all I really want is to pull the title out of an HTML file. So uh, you can try it. Yeah, it's probably more efficient. I mean, maybe we'll go a bit deeper, but the problem with turning XML or HTML into JQ is that it's very hard to do to model XML and HTML into JQ in the same way that you can, of course, model it in a way that is like not uh, lossy, so that you preserve all the orderings and white space. And uh, but if you do that, you will end up in a JSON structure that is like it's you don't want to query. Right? It. Yeah, it's like uh, it's going to be end up with a race of a race that is like it's like you don't want to write JQ queries for this. So what uh, what FQ does is it's actually kind of lossily turns it into a more JSON-ish. So then when you turn it back into uh, XML again, some things might get lost. It tries to keep ordering of things, if you want. But <laughs> I'm curious now. It's something to play with, and that's always fun. Uh, anyway, sorry, I was in the middle of saying, so JQ will be in the show notes. Uh, sorry, FQ. Um, mm-hmm. Any other links you want to give people? Your say your Mastodon handle would be a good start, given that's how we met each other. Put the link in the show show notes or something. I can, I yes, can send you the link. We'll do that. We will do that. Uh, and otherwise, I have. A, I think it's JQ JQ might be interesting, which is a JQ interpreter written in JQ. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I love recursion. And it's kind of 
it's kind of like uh, I don't. It's, it's just a fun project to see how it. It is. I was like, uh, it's like an any language you want to. It's interesting to see if you can write in itself the language. And Jacob didn't have any. <laughs> nobody, nobody had tried that I, when I that I know. So I, it turned turned out to not be that hard. But maybe it was just me having spent uh, too much time in Jaku, so I didn't think it was so hard. Uh, it it was it had some parts that was very hard to. I had to go back and read some more like academic papers about parsing to to remember again like how how you how do you do like um, uh, how do you do LL parsers with the re- recursive descent when you have binary operators and uh, it turned back memories. Learn a lot about. Uh, parsing at least <laughs> on the way cool. as i say so this will all be in the show notes uh so uh this is a quick jq lsp may be interesting for people which is a language server for jq language server give me a hand what does that yeah. mean uh so an lsp is uh uh like more most uh, modern uh, text editor have uh, lsp support ah, like a vs okay. code or uh like uh, NeoVim or yes. uh, Emacs, I think also has. So there is. So I have uh, an LSP for JQ. So it you can. Uh, so it does like syntax checking on the code while mm-hmm. you're writing, and you can also even press in some. At least at least in VBS code, you can kind of go to definition. So it will actually jump to where it's oh. defined, and it will actually. And it also checks for like. Uh, uh, it it keeps track of uh, the lexical scope, so you can so it will tell you that uh, this function doesn't exist or this binding doesn't exist. It, it's very useful if you're going to write a lot of JQ code. Oh, it sounds it, and I happen to be a VS Code fan, so th- this is you're, you're singing my song here. Yeah, I don't think I could have written JQ JQ without JQ LSP. Yes, I, I would have gone <laughs> insane. <laughs> that sounds fair. That must be one heck of a long dot JQ file, JQ, JQ. <laughs> it's like 2,000 lines, I think. It doesn't, it doesn't support everything JQ does, but it supports the most, uh, most things. Cool. Uh, but it, it, was, it was a way to, to learn JQ also for me to, to kind of like understand the, the, the really the nitty gritty parts of, of JQ. Right. It's, and I found a lot of bugs also. There have been, there are quite a few <laughs> open bugs now on JQ that is like, uh, because you end up with this very semantical thing, like so what does it mean to write this generate the plus a gen or a, like what does it mean if the assignment outputs several values on this side? Is it only the first that gets it? Or like it's a, it, yeah, it gets very, like may, maybe norm, like, the average JQ user that use doesn't will not hit this, but uh, if you're writing a JQ interpreter, then you will. <laughs> right. When you try yeah. to re-implement these things, you have to you and you have to know what to do. Like now, some parts, you get forced to to decide what does it mean when this happens. <laughs> That's actually a really interesting way to 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 check sort of if your language is fully defined. If you try to write it in another language and then it forces you to answer questions that the documentation doesn't answer, then you, you've kind of done a really good sanity check on yes. JQ by redoing JQ. And it's like one of the reasons why I really like that there are a, a couple of different uh, JQ implementations is that they, we, we have found a lot of things in the original JQ that is not that doesn't make sense or... Uh, uh, or now we know we, we can't. Some of some, some of them will probably be, get changed, and some some things maybe will stay weird because we can't change them. But okay, then uh, at least other, yeah, and then maybe the other some some other implementation maybe have to implement the weird way to stay compatible. Or maybe like there are there are some there are like uh, Jack for example, which is a Rust implementation of JQ, and that that one is is. Uh, Making a lot of progress and becoming compatible. Mm-hmm. I think, but I think the uh, the author author of Jake or fact uh, of Jack <laughs> is, uh, I think he's aiming more for like uh, some kind of correctness, uh, like try to make uh, how Jake how Jake probably should have been kind of. So there are some uh, there are some ways that are, are probably going to be uh, better. It's going to you can't like uh, I think it has like. Uh, 
if you index into null, it will actually throw an error instead of just, I think it is, uh, and JQ, I think, just returns null if you do it. I don't remember that. There are, there are okay, some yeah, semantics that is that. Like, JQ is very liberal <laughs> with some things, and and, uh, and Jack is going to be more strict. And maybe for, some part of the... Of, forgiving, I think. Yeah, word. very forgiving. And, and Jack, I think, is not going to be as forgiving. But uh, it also could be... I think it's so, and then some part. I think it's also because of performance that it's like, if you can uh, change the order of these things and reduce, you can skip doing some other things. I, I don't. The, there is a the, the Jack readme file has a lot of uh, explanations to why he chose to do some things. He even have uh, two academic papers about JQ. Like one, one is uh, one is an academic paper. I think he's, I don't know if he has presented, I think he sent it in the, one of the papers to present somewhere at some conference about it. I don't know if he has done it yet, but, but I can send you the links to it. It's interesting because one of, one of the papers is uh, about just defining the semantics of the language. And another one, I think the other one is the implementation of it, like how Jack implements it with all the different like uh, uh, lowerings into different, like uh, like a uh, virtual machine kind of, how how that works. You see, in, in, if you're into JQ, you should. It's interesting to read. <laughs> uh, well, even just with my computer science hat on, because I I studied formal computer science as 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 an undergraduate, so we did compiler theory, and so so a lot of this stuff is kind of fascinating. As I yes. blow the dust off my uh, <laughs> off my brain, and I try to remember back to my compiler course. Uh, but no, that's fascinating stuff. Look, again, thank you very much. All of these links will be yep. in the show notes for everyone. Um, and obviously, the most important thing to say is thank you for the work you do maintaining JQ. Because yeah. without JQ, my work life and my fun life would both be less good than they are because I use JQ both for hobbies, because I'm the kind of nerd who writes hobbies in JQ. Um, but even just with my work hat on, it makes my life easier. And it saves me a lot of time. So genuinely, thank you for the work you do maintaining JQ. And I should thank you. Thanks. To, I, should, I will forward the thanks to the, the other people who are. Please. I'd like to, I, I will tell Nico about it. Yeah. Uh, it. I will see if I can get a hold of him to see if you can, he can do a, He could probably tell you a lot more about the history of, he has been, uh, been around for a long while. It would be that would be cool kind of story. interesting because the origin stories of things tend to be quite fascinating. Yeah, because I, I, have, I have asked him about it a couple of times because it's a bit blurry for him also, I think. It seems like he doesn't even know, also know some of the oh. details on how, 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 this, uh, how Stefan, the guy who uh, started it, how, what the ideas was. So. But we see, maybe there will be a follow-up episode with Nico. We'll see. Hopefully. We we shall see, and of course, that's oh. evergreen content, so it can it can happen anytime, right? There's no there's no particular. It's not time constrained, which is the great thing about our origin stories. They stay true forever. Yeah. Anyway, maybe maybe I should thank some people. I I, I would like to thank yeah. Nico and Stefan and uh, Ichni. It's I don't I don't read I don't know his real name. <laughs> <laughs> that's, all. that's a very good uh, name. Emmanuel is also one, and uh, oh. I know now I only remember the active ones that are uh, working on it, but there are a lot. There are there have there have been a few maintainers that have worked for many years that are not active anymore. I think it's the William Langford maybe, uh, and uh, Michael Sulut and Daniel Tonnelli. I think is also have been active. So they they are probably the ones that have done the most work. I only I feel more like. Uh, uh, what do you call it? Like uh, just keeping the grass, cutting the grass a bit, and taking care of. <laughs> well, maintaining. you're carrying the torch forward. Someone yeah. else started the race, and you're carrying the torch at the moment. And then at some stage, you probably hand it off to someone else. I mean, that, that's the great thing about open source is that because it's yeah. open, it's it's free for people who have the time and the energy and the vision to to move things forward, and we we all get to benefit from you know other people's work, which is, I mean. These podcasts and stuff that we do, they're all uh, open. They're all Creative Commons and stuff because the whole idea is that we're trying to pay it forward. We've benefited from lots of things other people have done, and hopefully, we get to help others do other cool things. And 
that's sort of the that's open source idea, the, right? That's the reason why I'm here. So <laughs> talking about yeah. this, so yeah. let people know what. What they're there. What yeah. they're well, as I say, thank you very much for your time. That's... It was it was really good fun chatting to you. Actually, yeah, I, I we've only just met, and yeah, I feel like I, yeah. there are people. Right? You're, you're fellow nerds. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we could probably could probably have a lot of good fun over long beer but anyway thank you for your time today thank you for contributing and thank you for for being on and for all the stuff you do and um, enjoy the rest of your Monday thanks for having me